explained in more detail, please just use the chat box. Um, we will have a dedicated Q&A after the presentation. Next slide. Let me welcome and thank our speakers of today. We have uh, Melissa Fillion, Senior Corporate Campaigner at Canopy, and Amanda Kerr, Director of Strategic Initiatives at Canopy, joining us today. I'm Simone Seidel, I'm Consultant Fiber and Materials, and I'm joined by my colleague, Prana Pandey, Materials Program Coordinator, and my tech support of the day today. Before um, heading over to Amanda and Melissa, let's get an idea who we have in the room. Um, and uh, we can just do a little live poll to see um, what kind of stakeholder mix, what kind of interest mix we have in the room. Absolutely. Hi all, I'm Prerna and I will quickly be taking, we'll quickly be taking a poll of the audience just to sort of understand where our stakeholders are representing and I will be launching the poll now. You should be able to see on your screen in the next moment. And I request you all to take the poll. Maybe we just wait another 10 mm -hmm. seconds. We have a few more people just joined. Joining us right now, exactly. I'll just wait for a couple, about 10 seconds. I see a lot of people are joining in now, Simone. So I think I'll just quickly say that we have launched a poll. Um, I hope you're able to see it on your screens and we request you to take the poll so that we sort of understand how our stakeholder representation is today. Okay, I'll be ending the poll in a couple of seconds. Okay, moving forward, let's see how the results are. Thank you everyone for taking the poll. I think it is representative, even if some are still joining. Um, and also from an experience at Textile Exchange, uh, we have a lot of brand and retailer interest. And of course, especially also on, on, the, on the canopy topics, on the hot button report and on the hot button ranking, there is big brand and retailer interest, but of course also suppliers and manufacturers are here. Um, it's great to have such a balanced mix as well. Um, it shows also how relevant um, the topics are. And, and as it was only released uh, recently, we're really curious to, to hear more. Thank you, Prana. So again, at everyone, please type your questions into the chat box um, during the presentation of Canopy, and we will have a dedicated Q&A at the end. Your questions will be addressed and they will not get lost. So this said, uh, let's um, hear more from Amanda and Melissa. And yeah, over to you, Amanda, first. Thank you. Thank you so much and uh, welcome everybody. And of course, a huge thank you to the Textile Exchange team for coordinating and organizing uh, and supporting, um, reaching an even broader audience with our 2020 hot button report. Um, so my name is Amanda Carr. I'm Director of Strategic Initiatives at Canopy and you can go to the next slide. And uh, for those who haven't uh, connected with Canopy yet or uh, in the past, uh, Canopy is an environmental not-for-profit and we were established about 20 years ago and we're headquartered in Vancouver, Canada, uh, but we work and our work is international in scope. Um, the model of Canopy is to uh, engage with corporations and invest very deeply uh, in those partnerships. And we work on procurement uh, and specifically work on procurement to protect the world's forests, uh, biodiversity, species and climate. And um, Canopy is a bit unique uh, in the fashion space in that we don't have any membership fees or any financial um, relationships 
with both the brands we support and the producers that we work with uh, very deeply. So uh, instead, our funding comes from philanthropic foundations and individual donors who share our passion for forests and for sustainable fashion. Next slide, please. So what drives our work at Canopy is uh, taking care of the last uh, ancient and endangered forests and doing that uh, in support of frontline communities uh, and indigenous groups that are also uh, seeking those similar outcomes. So this is the state of the world's forests um, originally, uh, sort of pre-industrial revolution. Um, and there were great areas of interconnected forests. Uh, if we fast forward to today, which is the next slide, you can see that a lot of our original forests have disappeared. It's been at a fairly alarming rate, and at least 86 countries have lost all of their original primary forest cover. Um, each year, we lose approximately a football pitch uh, or a, a soccer pitch for those in North America uh, every six seconds. So we are seeing uh, continued deforestation. Next slide, please. So Canopy's work began uh, originally in the paper sector and we were focused largely uh, in North America. And we were most well known for greening the Harry Potter series. So we originally worked with JK Rowling to get uh, and secure and actually create um, a recycled paper for her uh, Harry Potter books with the publisher here in Canada, and then worked with her to expand that globally. Uh, we work with large newspaper publishers like the New York Times, Hearst, but about seven years ago, we started noticing that as some of those traditional paper markets were shrinking, um, we weren't seeing necessarily the same uh, kind of impacts we'd uh, expect in the forest industry. So we weren't necessarily seeing uh, some of those mills shutter. And instead, uh, and specifically in the Canadian landscape, we saw a lot of those mills being um, procured to be converted to something called dissolving pulp. And dissolving pulp uh, is made largely and mostly from trees. Uh, so uh, clearing of, of forests, um, not only primary forests. So uh, for example, in Canada, uh, softwood would go in from, uh, from forests that have never been logged before, but also uh, those areas are cleared and then often plantations uh, are, are, um, are put in their stead and that plantation fiber is going into the supply chain. Next slide, please. So the first step or process is to create uh, a, something called a dissolving pulp. And dissolving pulp is chemically uh, treated pulping process. And about 70% is ending up in fabrics. It goes into many other um, uh, things as well, things like uh, contact lenses, computer screens, uh, and there's other uses. But the vast majority uh, we found in our research was going into fabric production. Next slide, please. The dissolving pulp is then spun into, I call it like a cotton candy is what it always reminds me of when I see that ball uh, in the top left corner. Uh, and that's uh, done at a um, point in the supply chain that uh, is the man-made cellulosic fiber production. Uh, again, um, a chemical processing and different types of pulp are mixed together. Next slide, please. And it's then spun into thread and then ends up uh, in the fabric and, and on the runways and in our retail shops. So the brand of, of fabrics or the family of fabrics that are made out of trees or forest-based fabrics include rayon, uh, it includes um, uh, viscous, modal, lyocell, and then there's a number of trademarked brands as well. So uh, probably some of the most well-known uh, trademark brands, things like Tencel, uh, Leva, um, those are all made uh, primarily from forests. Next slide, please. So uh, Canopy started looking at uh, seven years ago where the fiber flow was. And what we found is that the large um, majority of, um, I'll just use the term viscous instead of man-made cellulosic to capture the whole family, but the large um, uh, production of viscous was mainly in China. When we looked at import data into China, what we found is that uh, countries like Brazil, uh, Canada, the United States, uh, Indonesia, 
were some of the biggest uh, exporters of dissolving pulp to China. And there was a correlation with those last uh, ancient and endangered forests that I showed on the map earlier. So we took this information uh, to brands initially, and we had a really positive response. And we were really encouraged to work with brands collectively and work with the supply chain collectively on solutions. So um, early igniters uh, joined us, folks like uh, Eileen Fisher, uh, Patagonia, Prana, uh, and then very quickly, um, uh, we saw leadership from Stella McCartney, H&M, uh, Indidex, um, Caring, and many, many others. And if we fast forward to today, uh, we now have 320 brands, retailers, and designers who are part of the Canopy Style Initiative, working on eliminating the use of ancient endangered forests in their supply chain and working towards solutions uh, of lower impact fibers. So if uh, you are a brand and you're interested in partnering with Canopy, as I mentioned, there's no membership fees. So the way that we do that is through a public facing policy. And Canopy is here to support the drafting of that policy to make sure it's consistent, uh, to make sure that we're all looking for the same things uh, at the end of the day. The latest uh, brand to join us was Amazon Private Labels, but we are seeing more and more brands uh, proactively reach out to, uh, to Canopy and to the initiative each day, which is wonderful. And uh, no brand or retailer is too small or too large. Uh, our sense is that um, we need to have solutions that fit every uh, type of business model. Next slide, please. So if you think about um, how, as a brand, you might work with Canopy, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting and quite long supply chain. So Canopy brings our expertise from forest floor up to that viscous fiber producer. And then we're looking to brands for you to work back and understand um, uh, within your supply chain, which viscous fiber producers you're buying from. And what's unique about the supply chain, if we were to compare it to say cotton, for example, is that the viscous fiber producers are fairly concentrated. And I know a number of them are on the phone with us today, um, but they're a fairly concentrated sector. Uh, so the top 10 largest control about 80% of the global market. So Canopy spends a lot of time and has a lot of partnerships uh, with viscous fiber producers as well. Next slide, please. Uh, in fact, we have 90% uh, of the entire global production now have policies in place. So much like we work with brands, we work with the producers directly and uh, they have wood sourcing policies in place. And sometimes it's the first time they've had a wood sourcing policy in place. Other times they've had one for a while and they align it with the, with the Canopy Style Initiative. But uh, fast forward seven years and with all of the brand support, uh, we now have a supply chain that's fairly united uh, in what we're looking to accomplish and achieve. Once a producer has a policy in place, you can go to the next slide. Uh, we work with that producer and one of the tools we have is something called the Canopy Style Audit. Uh, it's an independent audit that was developed by Canopy with support from um, a number of brands and it's carried out by a third party auditor. Um, and the Canopy Style Audit, we now have 72% of the global capacity has independent audit reports publicly available. So a little bit more about those audits. Um, they are completely transparent. So the full audit report is published both on the producer's website, as well as on the auditor's website. You can read them uh, in all of their wonderful detail. They're risk-based audits. So uh, they start at a very broad scale and then focus in more detailed if there's the potential for risk and try to um, uh, rule out that risk or uh, investigate it further. Uh, but those documents are very long, uh, they're very detailed. And so Canopy uh, has taken a lot of time to create a more usable uh, interface for that information. And that's something we call our hot button report. Um, and uh, that was what we just launched uh, in fall of this year. And I'll turn it over to Melissa to walk through the results. Thank you, Amanda. So yes, let's dive into the 2020 edition of the uh, hot button report. Um, uh, you can go into the next slide. And so um, first uh, off, uh, for those of you um, who 
you know, our learning about Canopy um, a little bit more today. Uh, this is the fifth edition of the Hot Button Report, uh, and we are very pleased to reflect on the progress that have been accomplished, um, you know, within the next, you know, uh, or the past uh, five years, but also within, you know, between the 2019 and the 2020 edition of the Hot Button Report. Uh, moving to the next slide. Um, so uh, a few pieces are new in 2020. Uh, they um, are there are three main highlights. The first one is that we have five new uh, criteria uh, and other you know um, fewer changes to the criteria to make the ranking pointier uh, this year, um, uh, up to date and also reflective of the current context. Um, so these uh, new criteria are well identified as such in the criteria section uh, on the online HUD button. Um, and also they've been shared uh, with the producers in advance together with opportunities uh, to take action. Uh, secondly, um, an, a new element this year is the fact that um, in addition to the very popular and user-friendly shirt color, which is a, a you know a representation of the hot button that is uh, very well known in terms of the yeah in terms of the shirt color, um, we have added uh, this year an additional legend to easily represent the status of the uh, audit and uh, the risk level within the audit as well. So these. Um, and this legend really come hand in hand with the shirt color for a robust assessment of the producer uh, sourcing. So for instance, a producer with a green shirt uh, can either be at low risk um, within their audit, or they can be also actively engaging suppliers if um, uh, you know, any known high risk has been removed from their supply chains. So that's a new icon to look for in the hot button online this year. And then the third uh, new highlight this year in 2020 is the fact that the hot button ranking now embeds a new and distinct section on chemical use and emission um, for which we have closely coordinated with ZDHC. Um, so that section reports on the progress uh, that are made by the producers to implement the ZDHC guidelines um, for wastewater, responsible fiber production and air emission. And um, that section of the hot button report also reinforces uh, the levels set by uh, ZDHC, which are the foundational, progressive or aspirational levels in terms of the implementation of those um, guidelines. So the results for this section are, are new this year. We expect much more uh, progress um, in the coming year. We know that um, you know, many of the producers are just starting to implement the ZDHC guidelines that have been released um, in, in 2020. And we're just really exciting to have a hot button this year that is uh, that you know that embeds both the raw material sourcing as well as the um, chemical use and emission. Um, next slide. Um, so on to reviewing the results of the hot button. Um, so uh, we're quite pleased that this year we have actually jumped from six to now ten producers that have green shirts. Um, these are Eastman, Enka, Formosa, Jilin, Kelheim, Tangshan Sanyu, uh, Xinjiang Chemical Fiber, also known as uh, Beilu, Yibing Grace, all have her uh, green shirts designations with uh, Birla cellulose and lensing um, that have obtained the first ever ranking of uh, dark green shirts. In terms of volume and production capacity, this means that overall we have surpassed the 50% uh, threshold. So 52% of the global production capacity have obtained a green shirt, which is a requirement uh, uh, for the um, 320 brand partners of Canopy that have commitments in place not to source from ancient and endangered forests. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
Um, every year, um, Canopy, you know, when we start the the you know the production of the hot button report, we actually engage each of the producers um, early on in the process. Um, and that results actually a little bit of a, a you know, for some of them a, a, in a bit of a race to improvements, to obtain more buttons, to take more actions. Um, and it, you know, it is a real acknowledgement of the effectiveness of the tools and it actually results in um, various meaningful actions being taken by the producers. And in 2020, despite the fact that we were all faced by the global, global pandemic, we have seen significant uh, actions and leadership from some of the uh, May Made Cell 6 producers. So uh, this fall, um, just in advance of the hot button report, we have seen um, four new audit contracts being signed. Uh, so this includes um, Ace Green, Century Rayon, Nanjing, um, Antelope, as well as the E22 Metsa joint venture. Um, so very exciting. And so let's keep an eye on those audit reports that will be coming up um, early on in 2021. Um, also in the fall this year, um, there has been new audit reports that have been made public. Um, so as Amanda mentioned, these audit reports are available transparently uh, you know, in public. Um, and as part of the newest one, it includes the audits of Lensing, Birla Cellulose, and Sanyu, which cover 40% of the global um, production capacity. And for those companies, um, this was um, a second audit that those companies were completing. Um, overall, it means that we have impressive numbers um, you know, that speak to the momentum of the Canopy Cell Initiative. Uh, with 72% uh, uh, having voluntarily gone through the independent uh, audit. Um, next slide. Now, in 2020, uh, and more and more, what we're seeing is that on the hot button spectrum, if we, you know, if you will, we see a clear distinction between the companies uh, that are engaging the producers that are engaging and those that are um, either not responsive or um, that are confirmed via the audit to have a uh, high risk in their uh, supply chain. So as a result, um, there is 10 producers that still have red shirts or red within their shirts in the 2020 hot button report. And this means that those producers do not meet the minimum requirement for compliance. Uh, that said, um, we, you know, it feels as though, you know, you know, as part of the collective, um, as well as um, the importance of, you know, fighting, you know, climate change uh, and safeguarding biodiversity, which, you know, we're all, you know, so often reminded in the news. Um, if we want to be successful um, with this initiative and in defending the, the rights of the frontline communities uh, and really putting some lasting conservation solutions in place, we collectively also must keep asking for change. So um, let's, I would say, um, you know, as a collective with more, you know, with the current brands that are part of the Gennady Stanley initiative and with more brands joining as well, let's keep uh, pushing and keep an eye on the companies uh, and, and continue to encourage them to uh, get out of this uh, red, uh, you know, zone that highlights risk. Um, some companies, you know, once the hot button report had been released, even if they had some red shirts, some companies have simply, you know, decided to uh, um, uh, take further actions, adopt a policy, sign a contract, you know, to complete the audit and start looking uh, uh, and, and do some due diligence with regards to their supply chain. So um, overall, just let's all keep um, continuing this work that has been started. Um, next slide. Um, a few, there's a few questions that we often get asked. So I thought that we could just um, review them and, and look at them in advance. So one of them, you know, we often get asked why 
uh, some producers that have obtained a minimum of 10 buttons um, or more um, still have red within their shirts. Um, so this is actually a criteria that was part of the hot button from the start. And it's a crucial criteria because we do want to reflect um, in an accurate way on supply chain risk and threats uh, to forests. So any producers that are known or confirmed by the audit as using pulp that is high risk would show some red uh, within their shirt colors. So even if uh, they have, um, you know, achieved the threshold of 10 buttons that would, you know, get them a yellow shirt, for example, because of the known high risk in their supply, um, then the red remains within uh, and on their shirt. Um, next slide. Another uh, question that we often get asked is whether the criteria are likely to change in the future. Um, you know, at Canopy, we recognize that all um, dark green shirt um, uh, and all of the, you know, pro producers that have achieved a dark green shirt, it actually requires a deep um, level of commitment uh, by the corporation, by their senior leadership and all of the operation staff. Um, and so, of course, right, like a, a big congratulations to all of the companies, uh, you know, that have achieved uh, dark green shirts. Um, in 2022, um, we will be uh, starting to uh, add additional criteria for the producers that, you know, or, and for them to actually continue to achieve or for new ones to achieve uh, dark green shirts. Um, so, for example, the third party verification audit will need to have a confirmed low risk result for the entire supply chain to achieve that dark uh, green shirt. And um, we are already starting to give advance notice of, to the producers about this um, uh, addition in the criteria. And uh, it is also part of the, um, in the online uh, section of the hot button in the criteria section, together with uh, other additional uh, requirements. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of brand implementation, uh, you know, of their policies, we know that brands really want to have a choice and diversity of options. It is important, you know, for, um, you know, for their business. And this is why we're so pleased this year um, to say that the Menmade Cello 6 products available under uh, green shirts include viscous staple uh, fiber, rayon, viscous filament yarn, as well as acetate. So in 2020, uh, we, you know, can celebrate the fact that collectively we have achieved both volumes and diversity of products needed for our brand partners to successfully implement uh, their policies. Next slide. And over to Amanda. Mm -hmm. We wanted to just take a, a, a couple more minutes uh, to talk about what we're looking at moving forward. Um, so Canopy does a lot of work uh, tracking and garnering interest in investment in what we call next generation solutions. So um, as we eliminate ancient and endangered forest fiber from the fiber basket for these uh, viscous products, what other solutions are we going to look towards? Uh, and there's some really interesting ones. I think now um, we've seen uh, four out of the top five largest uh, viscous producers invest in uh, using alternative fiber types. Uh, and we have some opportunities to close the loop. So things like recycled textiles are a viable feedstock uh, for cellulose. Uh, there are some innovators working on things like leftover straw. Um, and Canopy looks at this not only from a viscous perspective, uh, but also uh, for packaging. So in um, uh, Davos last year, you can go to the next slide, uh, we released uh, what we call Survival, a pulp thriller. And it's a plan for uh, the elimination of 50% of uh, what would now be uh, tree fiber 
in across packaging and across viscous sectors. You can go to the next slide, please. And what we mapped out was um, sort of how many mills would be needed, uh, how reliant we would want to be on existing plantation fiber, for example. Um, and, uh, and what we mapped out is that uh, we would need $69 billion over the next 10 years uh, to invest in what are substantial infrastructure projects uh, to completely transform 50% of uh, what we're currently using uh, for these forest-based um, uh, product types. To put it in perspective, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we, uh, Botox was sold for $63 million in just one day, of course. So uh, our hope is that if we stretch it out over 10 years, uh, as a society, as governments, uh, as corporations, uh, we can find um, this kind of uh, revenue and investment uh, to create a brighter future for forests and for climate and for species. Next slide, please. Within survival, we've also mapped out where there are existing untapped fiber baskets. So taking a snapshot, looking at uh, where are some of these solutions probably most ripe. And that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot to still figure out. Of course, anybody who's tackled circularities knows it's about collection, it's about sorting, it's about uh, these kinds of systems of distribution and connection that still have to be made. But there's some really interesting things happening uh, in the landscape and being driven uh, in large part by the viscous producers themselves. Next slide, please. In terms of opportunities, uh, there's uh, hundreds of millions of tons of straw that are burnt in India each year, for example. Those are the kinds of things as you think in your brands about substituting out plastic packaging that maybe we could be starting to uh, use as feedstocks for um, what would be paper-based packaging. Next slide, please. And there's 26 million tons of textile waste in China each year, for example. So uh, we're starting to see these kinds of solutions uh, get more spotlight, uh, come to market. And now as a sector and where we want to take Canopy Style Initiative next is to really make those commercially viable. Next slide, please. So one of the discoveries that we made through the process of the hot button and engaging producers and encouraging producers uh, on this path uh, identifying where there were brands, uh, also um, coming together uh, to look for equity investment. Uh, as I mentioned, four out of the five largest producers are now selling a product line made from recycled textiles. There's a total collective investment of 23, uh, 233 million, and nine producers have now signed on to our next generation for vision, vision for Viscous, which was launched uh, by 34 brands uh, last October. Next slide, please. So I mentioned our Pack for Good initiative. Um, that's another piece that is taking off. Uh, just last month, uh, we announced now we have 120 brands that are part of the packaging initiative of Canopy. If you're already part of Canopy Style, we're replicating the same model of support and change on packaging. And uh, if anybody hasn't had the opportunity to join us, uh, on, on either of these adventures together, uh, we're looking forward to supporting you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa and Amanda. Um, I, somehow we must have lost the, the slide views. So, um, and you have such a lovely picture on your last slide. Maybe we can bring it up before we start uh, the Q&A. Um, and again, I would like to encourage, I mean, it has been very, very clear, very well um, understood, I think. So there has not been so many questions come in so far, but please um, do type in your questions. We have about 10 to 15 max minutes to, uh, we have with Amanda and Melissa for any of your questions. We have one come in from uh, Sarah, and this was also, um, I think I would be really curious to hear. Um, the highest scores obviously went to the dark green, I got the dark green shirt. Um, what does really, what does make them stand out? And what is also the difference between the two companies with the dark green shirt? 
Um, Melissa, would you like to start by sort of describing kind of the things that get us to dark green shirt? And, and I can speak a little bit to some of the differences. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, yes, so within yeah, so within the hot button report, you know, there's various criteria, criteria with regards to, you know, the audit um, uh, as well as uh, work on conservation solutions, advancing um, uh, next generation solutions as well, uh, preferencing FSC and increasing the level of FSC. So for the producers that have darker green shirts. Uh, they are producers that have like deep engagement with you know within their supply chains that have like consistently um, supported conservation solutions and uh, that are very um, actively scaling up the use of uh, products that are made from next generation solutions as well. So it's a combination of having gained enough you know buttons to reach to, you know to reach the uh, green shirt level. Um, uh, the two producers that have uh, darker green shirts currently have also, you know, of course, like low risk um, results within their, their audits. And they just have like, you know, very actively worked on conservation solutions uh, and advancing next generations. And that, you know, has um, led uh, them to achieve those uh, darker green shirts. And then I would just add um, each year, it's very, very close uh, between uh, the, the top producers. And we see a lot of uh, uh, active engagement and intention um, from many of the producers to really understand the hot button, to understand what can be done. And one of the unique things um, that, uh, that, um, that was undertaken this year, uh, and it's, it's related to some of the change in criteria, we've been looking for um, very clear ways to recognize, and we inserted that, uh, very, very clear ways to recognize when producers who have the opportunity and responsibility to conserve uh, areas of ancient and endangered forest, to restore areas of endangered, ancient and endangered forest. And this largely is an opportunity that more integrated players have. Um, so folks, uh, the three most integrated uh, being uh, Sateri, uh, Lensing and Birla. And so Birla actually moved forward on a conservation initiative in an area that uh, in Canada's boreal forests, so an area that is completely intact, never been logged before. Um, and, uh, and even though that pulp is not going into the viscous supply chain, Birla took the initiative to invest in conservation planning. Uh, and now we have uh, a bilateral agreement to um, uh, move forward and look to secure conservation of 70% of that area, which uh, represents, um, it, it's a 1.1 million hectare area. So it's not in, insignificant in terms of uh, moving forward in a landscape of hope uh, for ancient endangered forests. And that was something that was recognized this year in Beerless Profile. Now, the next step, of course, is that it needs to be legislated by government. Uh, and so there's some work to do uh, with First Nations in the area, with governments. Uh, and so, you know, those buttons were gained this year. Will they stay uh, uh, in years moving forward? Will we be able to see that through uh, together with Birla? And of course, together with the Canopy Style Initiative, because I think we'll all need uh, to weigh in and think about how to support um, lasting conservation in the world's forests. Thank you, Amanda. And maybe before looking at a question also on the application and um, um, potential of our recycled um, feedstock for for viscose, may I ask uh, when 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 I hear about this race to the top and uh, new criteria, how how do you develop new new criteria? I mean, we're all talking about climate. We're all talking about biodiversity. There's many things to to look at, of course. And um, I would be really curious to hear a bit more on what to expect uh, next year and how um, how are criteria develop criteria developed and who, who do you develop them with? Yeah, so um, uh, so yeah, so the main buckets uh, uh, of criteria remain the same in terms of the main the larger theme 
um, of, you know, completing the audit, uh, working on conservation solutions, which also includes, you know, um, the importance of conserving forest to help safeguard, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the climate and also to make sure that, you know, within peatlands or within forests, all of the carbon that's within those forests uh, remain stuck within those um, ecosystems versus being emitted. So that would be comprised within the uh, bucket of the criteria um, around conservation solutions as well. So the main buckets uh, remain the same. I think it is more when we do um, add on or develop more criteria, it's actually to reflect where you know, uh, reflect where next uh, we feel that the industry should go. Uh, so one example, for example, on transparency uh, during the first years, um, one of the expectations for the viscous producers was for them to uh, be transparent about, you know, about their list of suppliers. So, uh, and as we saw, so like a few years back, I think like, you know, five years ago, like there was almost no transparency at all. Now that we saw that there was like a first big step that was made by the industry to be transparent, then we refined further the, the criteria to keep on, you know, to keep the level of ambition and to keep um, looking for leadership. So the criteria on transparency and traceability has been refined so that there's more precision. Not only are the producers expected to list their um, uh, suppliers on their website, but to actually provide more information about the countries where their dissolving pulp comes from. So it, it is really um, uh, an exercise that Canopy does to reflect on the progress that has been accomplished within the industry, to reflect on, of course, some of the priority elements, like um, a few years ago as well, there was um, no, like if I think of the first hot button report, there was actually no products that were made from uh, alternative materials. Now, as Amanda mentioned, you know, there is, you know, five companies that are um, uh, offering at scale products made from uh, recycled um, fibers. So it's actually to keep up with the pace uh, and to keep on uh, um, um, increasing the level of ambition that we um, uh, refined and, uh, and upgrade the criteria within the hot button. And then we're always backstopping and checking against the policies that have been put in place by brands and the policies that have been put in place by producers. So that it's that init initial partnership that really sort of um, aligns uh, the Canopy Style Initiative with the brands and then aligns the Canopy Style Initiative across the board, for example. So, um, you know, uh, within each of the policies, there's named areas of forest. We look back and make sure that when we're doing the audits, that those audits are connecting to those areas that are named in every uh, brand's policy, for example. So those are the kinds of, um, uh, connections that we look back to and sort of where we build that initial sort of unity is through that policy development. So a brand, so a brand who gets started um, with um, Canopy style um, would on the one end get guidance and clear kind of um, a clear idea what um, a policy contains and, and has to look like. At the same time, you get a lot of input from leading brands from brands with ambitious targets to, to also um, have those reflected in, in next steps and criteria. Is that, is that um, how, how, how would a brand have, how would a brand get um, support when getting started? Yeah, exactly. So the first thing we do, uh, we have an introductory webinar. Most of you have just seen most of it. <laughs> so the next step would be to reach out to Canopy and we talk through uh, a policy that fits your company. So we have a template that we can offer that, um, and we have a checklist of what the key criteria are to align with Canopy Style. Uh, but then we'd look to make sure that it fits your company, basically. Does it fit your culture? Does it fit the implementation and traceability tools that you have? Uh, and then Canopy uh, works largely one-on-one -on -one with brands. We come together about once a year. Um, we do the same with producers. So producers have their own policies and that's what they're being audited against um, is that, that standard policy language. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity um, to really understand uh, the individual circumstances that each producer faces as well as each brand. Yeah. 
And, and I think there is a question that goes into that direction also. Um, the requirements of forestry policy that companies agree to. Um, maybe I, yeah. I, I can imagine Becky's referring to the buyers, like the, not the, the um, producers, but the buyers of, of um, forestry based feedstock. So what, what um, forestry yes. policies does it include? So the focus of the Canopy Style Initiative and our, our engagement is uh, with the viscous producers. So, you know, when we saw earlier on in the presentation, um, you know, the slide with the, you know, with the supply chain, Canopy's focus is from the forest floor um, uh, to the viscous uh, producers. And I would say that the requirements for uh, the companies that are between the forest floor and the viscous producers really come from the viscous producers uh, reinforcing with their suppliers the importance of, of them to be able to be to be compliant with uh, the viscous producer uh, policies as well. So um, whether it has to do with um, the level of, of you know, um, well, first the level of risk of sourcing from ancient and endangered forests, but then in addition to that, the level of conservation and protection that has been put in place um, in the different types of uh, ecosystem as well, uh, preferencing FSC uh, certified uh, materials. So FSC is really, um, you know, the uh, certification that um, uh, is the most uh, robust and supported uh, by Canopy for uh, responsible forest management on the ground. Uh, especially in areas uh, that are not ancient and endangered forests, and so all of these, all of these requirements are contained within the viscous producer policies, uh, and then uh, the expectations are now uh, on to the either the dissolving pot producers or the harvesting companies to actually be um, uh, in conformance with uh, those uh, requirements of the viscous producers. Uh, you're on mute, Simone. Thank you. I hope that um, um, also responded to the, the to Becky who raised the question on the company policies. One more question, and maybe this is the, the final one for today. Um, how does Canopy work with emerging designers? You have a big array um, from startups all the way to the big um, retailers of the world. How do small designers? Yeah, we have a lot of small designers. Uh, uh, one comes to mind, Duffield Design uh, in Montreal uh, is, is one of our small designers and, and the early igniters, there were many small designers. So Tara St. James uh, from Study uh, New York uh, and others. And uh, it's, it's very similar. So we look for first that policy commitment. And sometimes with a small designer and a startup, it's framed a little bit differently. It's more about the vision that the designer is bringing to their product, but we look for that same alignment. So it's usually a bit less corporate speak and a little bit more the feel of the, uh, the new emerging uh, 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 designer's vision for their product and, and for their lines. Um, and, uh, and then we support in, in very same way. So uh, we ask you to try and understand uh, which viscous fiber producer you're buying from and support you in understanding uh, their sustainability performance. And uh, we know sometimes it's harder for smaller designers uh, to um, uh, really sort of attract the attention of some of the larger producers who, uh, of course, uh, because their businesses are large and they're very concentrated, um, and so uh, we, we help make those connections if they're needed as well. Thank you, Amanda. Um, let, it, let us conclude now and um, congratulations again and hopefully um, great success also for next year and for um, collaborating with, with us and many others. Um, again, everyone, uh, there will be the recording shared um, also together with the slides of today and please contact us if you have any questions. Um, also get um, signed up for the hub community where we want to share all relevant um, information and inform you on upcoming webinars. Two are already in the pipeline for next year. So um, 
let's all make sure we get uh, more and more of the green of the green shirts listed and the darker and darker greens available. And thank you so much to Melissa and Amanda and um, have a very good rest of the year and a good start into a new year, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Simone. Thank you, Simone and, and Berna and, and everyone who joined. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, thank bye-bye. Thanks for joining. Bye bye. Bye. I'll be ending the meeting now.